Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to episode 54 of our COVID-19 series, uh, of which we're very proud here at the uh, RSM. Uh, I'm very, we're very lucky today to have uh, an excellent speaker, and we're going to review uh, the year's progress, really, with this uh, disease. We're looking back on that. So I'll just read you a, a little bit from his Wikipedia entry. Um, Tim Spector, Professor Spector, is a Professor of Genetic Epidemiology and Director of the Twins UK Registry at King's College, specialist in twin studies, genetics, epigenetics, and the microbiome diet. He was appointed uh, OBE in the 2020 birthday honours for services to COVID-19. So, um, Tim, welcome to our, our series. And um, I think you got the OBE because of uh, the work you've done on this um, on this app. So. Should we start off by you telling us a little bit about the app uh, and, and how you came up with that rather excellent idea? Yeah, it, it all happened as I was cycling uh, back from St. Thomas's Hospital in, um, with about, in about mid-March, mid where they just closed down uh, us seeing twins. Uh, hospitals and universities were really closing down because of the increasing uh, number of cases. and really faced with months without all our research on hold. So in that cycle trip, I decided that we, we should try and at least find out what's going on uh, with COVID symptoms in our 14,000 twins around the country. And uh, thought the best way to do this in real time was an app rather than standard questionnaires. So uh, I went to our, uh, our partners that we'd been working uh, on nutrition with called Zoe, uh, uh, a local biotech company um, who had been basically developing apps for nutrition to personalize it. And they came up back with the idea, they absolutely loved the idea. And they basically about 40 people in this small company all worked uh, tirelessly for five days to produce an app. So we had this app up and running um, on March the 24th uh, on the first day of lockdown. Um, and without any idea whether it would work or not. There was no promotion, there was no money, uh, and we were expecting either to flop dreadfully or be closed down uh, by the government. And uh, neither happened, and within a 24 hours, we had a million downloads, mainly through social media. People just loved the idea of being able to tell somebody about what was happening to them when no one else was listening. So that was the super exciting thing that happened and, and it just went viral, crashed our servers um, and people just liked the idea. We, we were asking all kinds of symptoms to try and- uh, just, just tell people how they could get on the, not everybody will have seen your app. They, they, what, what's the kind of address, to, how would they find it? They put in well, Tim Spector you, you, or? Yeah, you, uh, it depends which phone you've got, but the best way is to, um, do go to a website called join uh, it's covid.joinzoe.com and right. then you can download it directly uh or from your uh app store on your phone you put the uh covid symptom study app and you'll okay. find it we got over four million downloads now um and we have uh about 200 million uh people's uh reporting records and nearly 2 million people's test results. So it's one of the biggest citizen science projects um, it, that's it, in health that's ever been. And people, we have about a million people still logging every day, and they've been doing this for some of them for uh, nine months or more. So uh, it's, you know, blown away all our expectations of what's possible with a who, an, who analyzes all that data then, Tim? I mean, that is a lot of data to look at. How, how does that work? Well, basically, it's a, it's a combined approach from uh, the uh, biotech startup, Zoe, who have a team of data scientists who are mainly crunching the data, uh, trying to work out algorithms. Then we've got a big team at King's College London um, with some of my colleagues in, in engineering and data science, uh, Professor Seb Orsola, uh, so team of about uh, 40 people there also working on this, plus clinicians and, and other groups all, all working on this to try and maximize it. And we send the data, a big data dump every day 
to the NHS and the government and uh, the JBC. And so, um, and we also, if you're on the app, you get the daily reports uh, uh -huh. and your maps and see what's happening in your area. So our idea is to be very transparent, very open. It's a not-for-profit exercise. And um, I think that that's in a way why the public have trusted us with this. Uh, and we're gonna now, uh, as we're in the vaccine season, we're re repurposing it from just symptoms and tests to also follow up what's happening with people having vaccines as well. And I think that's very topical uh, at the moment. Just shows it's so versatile, uh, this tool, once people get to use it. And I think it's gonna change the way people think about health apps. Uh, and it, you, know, you can do surveys in a few days that would take you years through traditional methods. Uh, you know, one and a half million people fill, filled a survey about their diet histories. Um, and we got the results in a week. Uh, you know, quite incredible, really, what you can do with modern technology uh, when it all comes together. Well, we'll put some information on the app and some of your or, uh, uh, publications around that uh, uh, on the information sheet after this, uh, on the web after this. A couple of questions. One was, you know, we have people sending questions before. People are asking questions now. We've got 10 questions in already. I, I'm not going to be able to, to oppose them all, but... Um, Somebody called Joe B, I guess they know who they are, says, how, how reliable is the data, given that it's entirely self-reported data? And then Frank Hay asked the first question. He says, Zoe estimated case, cases are going down whilst government cases are going up. Why is that? Is it, is it different people reporting? So a couple of questions there. Yeah, well, they, they sort of come to the same, uh, they're similar in a way because yeah. um, people do self-report they self-report their symptoms and they self-report their test results. But um, the way that uh, it works is that if, if someone reports on the app that they're sick um, and they have been, say, quite healthy for a week or more, they get sent a, an invitation from the Department of Health to have, be tested and swabbed. And so a proportion regularly since uh, May have had that exact system. So We've had a very systematic surveying of symptomatic people. Uh, and those rates slowly went up to the peak of the, uh, the second wave at about eight and a half percent positives. And we're now down to about four uh, percent positive uh, of those. So that's a, and it is a systematic way of doing it. It's not just symptoms, it's corroborated by uh, swab testing. Um, We've also compared our results to the uh, official ONS household survey over the, uh, since, since the summer, uh, and it tracks extremely well. So <clears throat> there's a paper in Lancet Public Health uh, last week that gives all these details for those who are interested. Um, so we see exactly the same curves as the surveys, and it follows more or less the REACT survey, which go, only comes out every two weeks although that tends to float around a bit more than uh, the, 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 two sur the ONS survey and ours. So we're always about five days ahead of the other ones uh -huh. and not quite sure why. So it, it, it's a very good match. So people are, should be reassured by what we're finding. Um, and it, it's a very successful method. You mentioned the word trust, Tim. So, you know, um... Do, do people trust your app more than they trust the NHS app? I, I think a lot of people got alarmed when there was a report that the NHS app got uh, sent on to the police. So I was worried that Mr. Plod was going to come and knock on my door uh, on the basis of, uh, of the NHS app. So compare and contrast your app and the, NA, the, the formal NHS app. Yeah, so there's no uh, formal tracking on our, on our app at all. So yeah. we don't know your geolocation or whether you've sneaked your next door neighbor for uh, <laughs> a, a gin and tonic in the garden. Um, it's, 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 it's based on postcodes. Yeah. And so we only get a very rough uh, area uh, and people do trust us more. And certainly when the NHS app was launched or, or failed to launch it several times, uh, people felt much more secure giving their data to us than to uh, the track and trace one. 
Uh, and I think that's mirrored not just in this country, but also in other countries. Uh, people initially download the government one and then uh, start deleting it, which they haven't done with ours. So I think as a longer term one, people are, are more relaxed about it because they're in control. And uh, we can't, if they don't enter data, we can't do anything with it. Do you know how many people are, have got the NHS app? Do, is that data available or? You've got 2 million people on yours, did you say? How, how many on yours? We have we four, 4 million people downloaded ours. Right. Um, I heard that about at one point, about 15 million people have downloaded the NHS app. Yeah. Um, but I think most are not actively using it. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's uh, people didn't like the fact that they were, you know it was a sort of big brother side to it, and that they might be wrongly flagged up also for being in contact with someone. Yeah. Um, so uh, I don't think it's been a great success. Uh, the track and trace app, as far as I'm aware, I haven't seen any great data. But it was never my view was it was never likely to be a success more than a, a, a fraction of, uh, of the total, all the plans together to reduce things. So it was overhyped anyway. Um, and we had a lot of politics starting our app about uh, pressure for us to um, shut down in case it distracted people from the official app. Yeah. Um, but luckily we kept going and it's proved a fantastic uh, research tool as well. Well, congratulations on that. Time's moving on, and, and I thought it would be really interesting to get you, Tim, to analyse the, the last year. I think Simon Wesley said last night uh, in the In Conversation with uh, Rachel Clark that it's almost exactly a year since the first cases arrived. So let, let's quickly kind of go back over the, the last 52 weeks, starting right at the beginning. I mean, what were we slow to recognise this problem in the first place? Were we slow to react, um, let, let, you know, we're not slagging off the government in particular, they've had a, a tough year, but I mean, we've got to learn the lessons. So I'd like your insight into that. So starting at the beginning this time last year and then going right into March when you know, the, everything started happening lockdown wise. So your thoughts on that? Well, I like most people was, was pretty oblivious to things, you know, last December um, and so, uh, hearing a bit about this Chinese virus, you thought it would just probably stay uh, localized to Asia, uh, like the previous ones. Um, and it was only in January when I uh, bumped into a, a virologist, Peter, Peter Openshaw, who said he was really worried about this, that I, I started to um, uh, get more concerned. Um, and I think we we didn't really pick up a lot of these early cases. And uh, it was interesting from the app. Uh, one of the first things we, when we launched the app, is that we had thousands of people telling us they'd got sick in December and January. Mm. And uh, at the time, the government were denying this, and it was a sort of these guys are crazy. Um, everyone just, you know, is um, got mass hysteria, and they're trying to convince that this is true. But in retrospect, there was a lot of people coming back from their ski holidays that were infecting everybody, and um, uh, we should have paid much more attention to that. We should have had an early warning system in place to say, well, there's some new virus coming along. You know, what is it? Um, you know, could this possibly be related to the, what's going on in China? But I think we had a bit of a blind spot in the early days about what we were looking for. It was seen as very much, uh, you know, a flu-like illness, and that was it. And so the fact that actually there were a whole myriad of symptoms put people off and so we didn't really pick up the signs early enough we was we were just you know we were picking experts who were respiratory flu experts and they didn't look outside that that's why we only picked two symptoms at the beginning yeah, um, yeah. and so you know the medical staff had just said okay it's got to be fever or cough and if you don't have those well, you know, you, you can't really have it. And so they were missing half the, half the cases because we didn't take a, didn't collect any of that information. We didn't take a, a broader view of this, this whole problem until much too late. And, uh, and, and by then we, you know, we we're well into wave one and we had this big problem about, even when we picked up 
uh, anosmia uh, as uh, you know a few clinicians had pointed out this was a uh, coming up as a sign in in intensive care units uh, and should be looked at our data very fast on the app showed this was uh, 10 times more predictive than any other symptom and that 60% of people with COVID uh, lose their sense of smell. And yet it took uh, seven weeks of lobbying before uh, the government and NHS changed their criteria to even allow people with this to get tested. So um, there was a lot of this resistance, rather a mindset that I think um, was, was wrong at the time that this is just a flu-like illness and everything else is a distraction. Well, there was a lot of criticism from Richard Horton, John Ashton, et cetera, et cetera. And, and lockdown was introduced, I think, 23rd of March. And I mean, the received wisdom is that it was two weeks too late. But do you think that's right? Well, maybe it should have been before two weeks that, that they, they started to restrict people's movement. Certainly it wasn't ideal to have Real Madrid coming into play Liverpool. In, uh, in no, I mean, I think... Mark, was it? I think everyone admits there were big mistakes made and it, it's obviously easy to do that judgment in retrospect, um, but clearly the modeling was wrong. The advice given to the government uh, was wrong. The way the doubling, S doubling rates were calculated were wrong. And we should have listened to what all the clinicians were saying in Italy uh, is, you know, they were, they were shouting, saying, you guys are crazy. You should shut down now while you've got a chance, you know, and, uh, we, we didn't, and because uh, I guess we, a bit of hubris, you know, uh, thinking that Britain does know best and that we, uh, uh, and I think this is, should be a great lesson in humility that, you know, we're, we're no longer head and shoulders, uh, you know, the best uh, medical system and, and intelligence in, in Europe. We, we need to look around what's happening in other countries much more uh, yeah. than, than we do. Let's dump British exceptionalism, uh, shall we? Okay, so so we're in the lockdown now through March into April and so on. I mean, uh, what about the fact that at the end of lockdown, we went back pretty much to normal. In fact, you know, eat out to help out was uh, was actually encouraging people to to mingle and 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 uh, in restaurants and so on. So, was was that a mistake too? Uh, yeah, in, in retrospect, it was a mistake. Um, you know, all of us enjoyed going out, but I guess what, what we've sort of learned, I think, is that this stop-start idea of, of lockdowns uh, causes the problems. And um, the idea you go from a total lockdown to then a release, uh, where you pretty much go back to normal, uh, it, it, you know, is counterproductive. I mean, Luckily, uh, rates didn't shoot up straight away um, in the summer, it stayed low. And I think that was partly because of the, the weather. A lot of it was outside. Uh, and and um, I don't think it did as much damage the eat out to help out as people have, have said. But I think it was the general mentality that you, you, know, you have these periods of lockdown and then a release and everyone goes crazy and then you, you advertise there's another lockdown coming up. So everyone rushes out, meets all their friends, goes to the pub, uh, increased infections. Then you lock up with your family and, and household with your infections and it increases again. And we've, uh, you know, we're seeing uh, some of the effects of that in, in, in places like Wales at the moment. Yeah, just talk us through Wales because they've gone from sort of extreme lockdown to total release and then now they're stopping people drinking alcohol and closing pubs at six o'clock in the evening or something. So, I mean, that's quite a model in how not to do it, isn't it? Uh, not, not that I got anything against Wales, that's a lovely place. Well, yeah, I mean, poor old Wales really suffered because they were one of the first, South Wales was one of the very first epicenters of, of this in, in March. And they had lots of sports events. They had a, a stereophonics concert there. Everything happened in that area and uh, they had rugby matches, um, all kinds of stuff that <laughs> shouldn't have happened. And so they're really bad cases in the beginning and they now uh, have three, nearly three times the rate of the rest of England at the moment. And they've run these experiments of these um, uh, fire breaks, which you know, a lot of people were calling for at the time 
but they should have been realized this is a pure research experiment. And yeah. it, it, when you look at what's happened to Wales now, the rates, um, they came down with a fire break and they're, they're going back up to where they were um, and heading higher uh, after that fire break. So they don't work. And, and, and I think we just need to realize that that's a, a very good model of why you need a, a longer term policy to deal with social behavior. Uh, you, people will react to these short, sharp changes socially and with compliance will change. And, and you know, we're not, we're not lab rats uh, and none of the models um, that some, some uh, modelers are putting out there really realize that as, as uh, the environment changes, people's uh, reactions will change. It's a dynamic effect, not a, not a purely one that you can map out on a, on a, on a bit of paper. Of course so, it is. And then, I mean, in London at the moment, the, the vibe is that the rates are going up and I'd be interested to hear what your app uh, is telling us about that. And, and you know, the, the rumour is there might be, uh, we might shift to tier from two to three next week. So that's just going to drive everybody out on a sort of mad pre-Christmas shopping spree this weekend, isn't it? And, and so what are your thoughts about that? Where are we in London and, and, and beyond London? So um, the rates today nationally, and people can see this on the app if they want to go to it. So we're around 19,000 new cases um, in the UK a, a day, which is down from 43,000 about six weeks ago. So 40% of where we were. The North is doing really well. They've, there's still our value of 0.8 in the North. Uh, and we're all merging around the middle and London uh, the East is doing well, Southwest is doing well, um, but London is, the, the decrease has stopped and is uh, flat or slightly increasing. Um, and we see, when you look at London, you see differences between North, most of the cases are in the North, North London uh, at the moment. So, um, but I think a bit big mistake if uh, London goes uh, into tier three, I think everybody should be coming down a tier uh, as we and, and stay somewhere between tier one and tier two until April, until we see vaccine taking effect. And this on off business is a total disaster and we should absolutely avoid it. Look at Wales, see all the problems that causes. You know, you can't imagine that the amount of drinking and, and festivities are going to come if, you know, two, people say in two days time, that's it for another six weeks. Uh, it would be madness to do that. So I think we also need to think about these tier systems because the whole point should be the capacity of the NHS uh, to deal with it locally. And at the moment, according to our data, uh, the percentage of COVID cases in, in hospitals is somewhere between 5% and at most 16% around the, around the counties. So London has plenty of spare capacity. So if we know we're not gonna get rid of this virus before the vaccine. So we just need to make sure that the NHS is under control. People aged over 60 are not getting it at, at really bad rates. Have some clear criteria. Just, just having some league table without any uh, criteria about who's getting relegated and promoted. Um, and this on off effect is madness. So we need much more consistent pattern that uh, we, can, we can all relate to. Because I think if you tell people the truth and you tell them what's going on in your county or area, so these are the figures, this is how full your hospital is, people will behave responsibly. But you know, they need to be part of the discussion, not just being uh, treated uh, as if they're you know, cattle. You get the impression that the politicians love coming on, you know, making announcements uh, uh, from broadcasting from from uh, Downing Street. Are we going to do this? We're going to do that. And uh, I mean, but but of course, that stimulates the opposition from the sort of libertarian wing. Um, and that kind of uh, raises the question. I mean, there is a group of people who say that all these lockdowns, all these restrictions are, are wrong. No need. Um, I mean, what's your answer to? To them, Tim, I mean, the, the sort of extreme view, that uh, libertarian view, which is quite widespread and it's all over the social media. Well, I'm really against any, any extremist view from people who would have us be in total lockdown until 
April and those that say let it rip uh, governments can't tell us what to do it should be personal choice um, and I but I, I do think we need to make such major decisions on people's liberty based on evidence not just on politics and fear so um, we, know, we we are have gained a lot of knowledge so far about what works and what doesn't work and uh, what is clear is as you tighten restrictions you reduce compliance and the government's own data and surveys show this so um, we know there's an economic impact of this that is much greater in the deprived people in our society than it is in uh, you know, well-off people like us in the medical profession uh, and so there's collateral damage and I think this whole idea of providing evidence before you change people's you know loss of liberty etc let's get some data out there to say why we're doing it rather than it a knee-jerk reaction as you said to get some publicity um, to make people feel they're doing something important I think are we actually saving more people than killing them you know what about the suicide rate what about uh, young people's mental health? What about unemployment? What about uh, people not coming forward with their cancers? Um, as you increase the restrictions, all these this balance uh, really changes and we do need a much more transparent discussion of this balance uh, going forward. And that's, that's where I'm sitting at the moment. And there's a number of my colleagues who are also saying this, that we just need more visible data, more open discussion without having to resort to total libertarianism or total fear tactics and you know people uh, having pictures of of uh, bodies on trolleys in the local hospital uh, mm -hmm. I think we've got to have a sensible middle ground here do you, and do you think the government of, of, of the mistakes they've made is because they've gone too much towards the fear I mean did something there's a question come in it saying asking whether Sweden in, in retrospect got it right by by being more libertarian than than many other countries what was what, what's, what's your view on that the um well i think the government realized they'd got it wrong at the beginning and they've slightly overreacted uh in the second wave yeah uh, is my view um and you know they've always ended up taking the statistics that is the worst case scenario yeah and and, and not actually taking the range of, of values and discuss this more so I think uh, it's sort of understandable because no politician wants to be the one to take a risk. Uh, it's much easier to overestimate the risk and overplay it because that penalty will be several years on, you know, in cancer cases or suicides or whatever. Um, whereas the immediate one is we've got this death count uh, every, on the news every day, which, um, uh, people relate to, which is totally the wrong metric, but that's what we use. So I think um, uh, I think there has been no reaction. I think um, Switzerland and Sweden are, are the two countries that have uh, actually uh, bucked this trend. And I think only time will tell. Um, but my feeling is that there isn't a huge difference between uh, what's going on. Um, even Germany now. Uh, is facing problems. So there's a sort of slight inevitability that uh, w whatever you do, it's going to, you know, we're going to have a, we have to face the facts there is a risk, there will be mortalities, and we ought to be just balancing our economy uh, and our mental state against this a bit more. So uh, I think we, we should give, give the citizens a bit more uh, uh, scope to for them to be you know give them the data and allow people to act responsibly like they've done in in switzerland and uh in sweden more so but I, you know time will tell who's correct but i, I suspect there won't be huge differences across europe I, I like trust the people that's that's a pretty good message well tim listen your your app is pretty clever but can it can it tell the future and what does what is your app telling you about the risk of phase three and whether the vaccines are going to make a major difference and uh, that's a bit that's a, I don't really mean the app I mean I'd like your opinion on obviously well the app is not a crystal ball unfortunately but the uh, we, we could we could have an algorithm for it um, so at the moment we can just about plot a couple of weeks ahead 
Um, but looking uh, looking at other um, respiratory virus epidemics, looking at what happened in, uh, in in other areas, it's clear there's a wave-like pattern to what we're seeing. That regardless of what you do, um, these these epidemics come and go in in waves. And I, you know, I although there's some disagreement about terminology. Um, I think it's fairly clear we're coming out of the second wave. Um, it may take a long while before um, it gets back to baseline, but normally uh, if we'll, we'll see a relaxation after a wave and then there'll normally be another one. And uh, in January and February, I think the cold weather, people will be inside more. The virus likes cold weather. We will have, in my view, some uh, I, I guess it's more likely to be in February, uh, a third wave that's going to affect us before the vaccine really kicks in, which in my, my eyes will be about April. So, but hopefully if we're vaccinated, hospital staff um, and a lot of the old people uh, before February, um, there's a chance that the, the mortality rate anyway will be a lot lower and, that, and the pressure on hospitals will be less. So. I, I'm, I'm much more optimistic now um, with these vaccines than, than I, I was, say, a month ago. Great. Well, that's a good Christmas message for us all. Catherine Royce, I'm sorry we haven't had time for the questions. We've got 57 of them there, so I can't possibly ask them all. I promise you we will look at the questions, we'll analyse them, and we'll, we'll uh, put them to a panel uh, uh, in the new year. But Catherine Royce says... So what's Tim's view of the Christmas five day breakout, she calls it, it's quite a good expression. Um, we're, we're given by our dear leader uh, playing Father Christmas uh, on his way back from Brussels. <laughs> five well, day, the five days breakout, good, bad or indifferent? Um, I think he was between a rock and a hard place. Uh, you know, the British are very obsessed with Christmas. Um, in other countries, Christmas is just 24 hours. Um, and so they turn up for one meal, uh, get drunk and go home the next day in most of Europe. Uh, we spread it out and- yeah. uh, Get drunk uh, for a whole week. Yeah, and that's, that's a bit of the problem. Um, so I think uh, if he hadn't relaxed the rules, people would have broken them. Um, and so some relaxation had to be in place. What? What I'd rather see is that it, rather than it's concertina, you know, people might have done this in a more um, spread out way. Uh, but I think it's a reason, to be honest, it's a reasonable compromise. Uh, I don't think there's any perfect answer to this. Um, I just hope that uh, people don't overdo the socializing. And the key is uh, not having too many different households uh, mixing in that time. And then afterwards, Possibly people should think about um, keeping to themselves afterwards so that if they are infected, uh, they don't spread around afterwards. So I think we will see a slight uh, up, upsurge after Christmas, but hopefully it's not going to be uh, too bad to overwhelm anything. Uh, you know, it's easy to criticise. It, it's hard to come up with the uh, perfect solution. OK, Tim, we're nearly running out of time. I got one one last question, which is, I mean, you're you're a bit of a uh, crystal ball man. So next year, just give us, you know, wh what's going to happen next year? I mean, the longer term, when when, when is this going to be over this this tedious process that we're, we're all subjected to? Can you your thoughts? Well, I think the acute problem, I think, will be over by uh, April. And then we'll be in a phase of, um, uh, for at least another year, of having low levels of disease, outbreaks, uh, small infections that will come and go. Uh, and I think we're still going to be having social distancing for uh, at least uh, another year. But hopefully this, this isn't going to affect us uh, too much uh, socially. Um, and I think a lot of this will hopefully be be more voluntary, uh, as as you indicated. You know, we're unlikely to instantly go back to uh, our previous practices. Um, half the population are probably very happy working at home now, 
And so there will be less people commuting, less people on public transport. Um, but I think we've probably got at least a couple of years where we're gonna see the, this virus appearing and disappearing uh, like, like we used to bad, just having bad flu uh, breakouts every year. And we're gonna have uh, repeated in, in, injections. We may be tested uh, to see if we have antibodies. Um, and we'll be understanding a bit of the interactions for our patients, uh, you know, those on immunotherapies or uh, other drugs, uh, much more about that. So I think uh, this isn't all going to be over in one go. It's going to be a, but a slow phase out. But I'm, I'm optimistic that we've, if we can uh, just get our mental state together until, um, until Easter, um, we can hang on in there. Um, it's going to get a lot more pleasant after that. And we can start to uh, relax a bit and even go on holiday, which would be lovely. Oh, yeah, it'd be nice to go on holiday, wouldn't it? Tim, I think it's, it's about time uh, we finished now. Um, thanks so much. Uh, fantastic uh, insights there. And uh, I love the crystal ball uh, uh, clairvoyance uh, from you. That was really helpful. Uh, congratulations on your amazing app. Uh, I encourage everybody watching to, to uh, log on to that. Um, you, you've got the OBE. I think you should have uh, probably been given, raised to the House of Lords. Uh, Lord Spectre has a, has a ring to it. <laughs> um, don't go away because I've got a few announcements to make. Uh, we, we have uh, at the RSM produced um, a short half hour, 30 minute video uh, entitled COVID and the festive season. And I guess the message is uh, stay smart, stay apart. You know, don't cuddle your grandma is, uh, is the bottom line from that. And we've got Kate Garraway who our husband, unfortunately, been devastated by this disease. He's still um, in ITU, uh, I think. Then uh, next Thursday, last one of these for the year, uh, Simon Wesley is interviewing Clifford Scott. And they're talking about policing health in a pandemic. So actually, a lot of the things we've been talking about uh, uh, will come up there. I mean, uh, I think that that is really interesting. And also our, our In Conversation series, we're very proud of... Uh, of those, uh, Rachel Clark was on last night, and next Wednesday, Martha Lane Fox, uh, who uh, had a very interesting career and a devastating car crash, of course, in in Morocco, is talking uh, next Wednesday evening. So, Tim, any any last thoughts? You, uh, we need a Christmas message to uh, our viewers, and they pass that on to all their patients, and mainly medics uh, and healthcare people watching this. And any any last thoughts of? Uh, yeah, I think. There are things that everyone can do to be safe at Christmas uh, that don't involve testing. 60% um, of people with COVID-19 have uh, loss of sense of smell. And so test yourself and your family uh, regularly because it can be hard to pick up in children and the elderly. So stick some coffee beans under their nose or things like that. And 20% of people with COVID symptoms are not the classic uh, three that the uh, the government NHS believe in. So do keep an open mind on what COVID is, because uh, I think if we focused and gave information about, you know, that fatigue and, and headache are the very first signs of COVID uh, in the first few days, we could cut down a lot of these infections at Christmas. So if you're in doubt, you know, don't take a risk, stay on your own for a few days. Uh, I think that would be my Christmas measures for everyone to stay safe and obviously eat as healthily as you can to uh, keep your gut microbes uh, helping your immunity. Um, <laughs> so we need a Mediterranean Christmas, do we? A very diverse plant Mediterranean Christmas, not just Brussels sprouts. <laughs> but okay. Plenty of red wine, that's good for you. So that's oh all. yes, well I've got, I've got a cellar full of that downstairs. So thank you so much, Tim. You've been absolutely brilliant and uh, uh, have a good Christmas, Happy New Year, and I hope your predictions uh, come true. Bye now. Bye.